Well, thanks for joining me, guys. It's a, it's a pleasure to talk to people whose work I admire always, and I do admire your work. Um, I've, I'm a big fan of the, the shows you've worked on. And, you know, Hal and I have spoken before about his career. Could you just explain to start with, so people know who I'm talking to, because this will be in a video and an audio version, um, who you are and what your job entails? Uh, sure. Well, my name is Grady Kofer, um, and I am the visual effects supervisor on the production side for uh, The Mandalorian. And what that means is, um, to try to capture that quickly, is you are taking the stories that your your uh, filmmakers have, have created, right? So John Favreau writes these wonderful scripts. And the first thing is you kind of go through all those scripts and you're trying to figure out how to tell this story visually and, and come up with different techniques, uh, visual effects techniques, of course, animation techniques from how, and in the best way to, to tell that story. And then I'm working throughout pre-production, uh, kind of developing, um, uh, help, helping kind of develop those ideas, uh, working with the virtual art department, previs team. And then, of course, we shoot the movie and then the real fun starts, right? Then we go into post-production and I o oversaw that with a lot of uh, a lot of vendors and present that work and, and collaborate with Favreau and Dave Filoni and Rick Fukuyama, the, the, the creative the creative team, uh, to to execute those shots. Great. And Hal? Uh, I'm Hal Hickel uh, and I was the animation supervisor. Um, so, you know, sort of anything that moves, whether it's creatures, characters, um, droids, but also spaceships and other kinds of vehicles that, that you know, can't be built for real that, that we're doing in visual effects, um, my team will execute that. And um, as Grady said, you know, we work with John to help tell his uh, story and, and figure out the best way to do that. And so, um, you know, we're frequently asked to um, not just move things, but, but figure out the best way to, you know, frame them and what, what shots to, you know, how we design our shots to tell the story well. And, uh, so it gets into a lot of different areas, but at its simplest, it's, you know, bringing things to life. And, and that's sort of my department. And I want to give a shout out, um, to Paul Cavanaugh, who he and I kind of split duties uh, across this season and in, um, supervising the animation. So, uh, kudos to Paul as well. Yeah, it's a very collaborative uh, area that you work in. And with a show like this, you know, it's won an Emmy previously for its effects work. And the the audience, the expectations grow and they hope that it will continue to improve, you know, story-wise, character-wise, uh, visually, or, or, you know, the audio, everything. And fans have grown attached to characters and storylines. And meeting those expectations and delivering, a you know, a compelling story, while still staying true to that sort of Star Wars essence must be a hell of a challenge. God, that's that's the key to all of this, right? Because I think uh, most people would agree this season was huge, right? It, it was pretty epic. And, and a lot of that just came from the kind of themes that, that John was exploring this time around. They were kind of bigger themes, you know, rebirth and and uh, redemption and, and uh, the reunification of all of the the Man Mandalorians and stuff. So these were really really big stories, and they did demand that the that the visual effects and the world building and the level of animation all kind of be elevated, right? Be kind of taken to a new level. But the challenge, of course, is to do exactly that to really kind of push the envelope, but 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 keep the show grounded, keep it kind of honest to what uh, true to what. The Mandalorian has always been, and that is, yes, aiming for the highest level of visual effects and animation, but doing that while balancing with more kind of traditional, kind of practical things. You know, the the old school tricks that we grew up with, the animatronics and 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 you know practical creature effects, um, model miniatures, all of those, all those really kind of charming old school tricks that make things feel more. Um, I don't know, lived in and real and authentic and kind of grounded and hit that that kind of nostalgic Star Wars feeling. Mm, yeah. I, I look at the sort of scale and scope of this show and it just seems to grow season upon season. And, you know, there are points where I kind of had to remind myself, this is a TV show. <laughs> you know, there's a Star Destroyer crashing. There are, you know, dozens of Mandalorians descending for that final battle there. I mean, it's just just got just about everything in this. You know, you go from environments with water and fire and lush greenery, um, 
you know, within caves, you have flying creatures, space battles, sabers and holograms. You must feel like you've got all the toys in your toy box there at times. Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny that Mandalorian series is the first thing I've worked on that was meant for the small screen. Um, but that said, we've premiered two of the seasons, uh, season one and, and then this one, season three, at the El Capitan in L.A. and and screened episodes on the big screen. And they look great. Um, I don't think we're doing anything differently. I think that the the main thing that I had to get used to on the show is that um, while the quality level is, the bar is just as high as anything I'd worked on before. Um, and uh, to be honest, if if people had come to I'm asking, or, you know, any of our veterans asking for something less, I, I think people would really struggle with it anyway. So like, how, how do we even do that? Um, but still... Uh, the thing that I had really had to wrap my head around, even going back to season one, was the volume of the work. It's it's massive. I mean, it's double even the largest tentpole summer films. It's double that. And we do the post-production, I don't know, I think in a similar amount of time that we do a big film, but it's, it's double the amount of work. So the scale is really um, something to contend with. Fortunately, ILM has a great history and Lucasfilm generally with managing huge visual effects project. They kind of pioneered that on the uh, prequel films, Star Wars prequel films. Those Before those films, visual effects projects had never come close to that many shots. And those films really taught us how to do really huge, complicated sh- uh, you know, programs like that. And it's only continued over the decades since. So but that for me was, was, the volume itself was one of the biggest Challenges that it's only grown series upon, you know, first, um, you know, uh, season one, season two, now season three, uh, they, it's only gotten bigger. So. Mm. And, and I, I would say a, in all of, go on, sorry. Well, I was, I was going to say in all of that, I feel like John is a pretty good partner, you know, and, and not just because he's uh, a very clever storyteller and, and he makes sure that the visuals that we're creating are kind of in support of and, and that story that he wants to tell and, and, and enhancing that story experience. But also because I kind of feel like he's a bit of a fan of visual effects in general. You know, he's got, he has lots of experience. Um, he's, uh, he has great instincts about what works and what doesn't. He's always interested in kind of the latest, uh, the latest tools. So, um, that helps, right? We, in, in, in reviews and kind of collaborating with John and his team, we're very open about what, what's achievable, what we, you know, what we want to aim for, what's attainable. Um, but we're definitely not afraid. And certainly ILM isn't afraid of, 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 of aiming high. Mm. ILM's got that long history of, you know, pushing the boundaries of VFX. How does that kind of legacy kind of influence and bolster your your approach and mindset as a as a team working on you know the latest and greatest TV show. Well, I mean, and I I feel like it's uh, it's great to work on a show that does two things. It 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 aims it wants the the highest level of of visual effects and animation, but it it also kind of honors the great traditions of uh, uh, you know of the the history of visual effects. So. We kind of incorporate that a little bit um, in into production. Like whenever we're we're breaking down a sequence, um, Hal worked on a great a great scene. You could talk about it the the kind of the great finale at the end of the season, where you have um, you have this this battle, the space battle happening up above Mandalore, and all of these Tie fighters and bombers are attacking a uh, a light cruiser. And and I remember how you talking about the kinds of um, pads that the that the the actual Tie fighters could take whenever they were shot as miniatures, and how that could inform um, the kind of things we would do in animation. So it's kind of nice to have, in a way, not guardrails, but like parameters that are mm. based on the way things were done in the past. And to me, that when you watch it, knowing that these days we can kind of do anything we want, but do you really want to? It's kind of best sometimes to kind of honor and kind of live within that Star Wars world that you know that uh, that we all grew up with. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We have, we have loads of conversations about, um, is it Star Wars y or not? And that can be, have to do with just the simple design of something. You know, those conversations are generally with Doug Chang and his group between him and John. And, 
Um, but then, you know, when it gets to our work, designing shots or the way something's animated or framed or just used narratively or, or, you know, fits in the edit. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's a feel thing. There's kind of a style guide, but the fun part is we don't have to be religious about it. We try to, we, we always want to talk about it because it can be easy to sort of side slip into other, you know, something that feels like, like just say a, a shot of a spaceship arriving at a planet, something simple like that. It can easily feel like Star Trek instead of Star Wars if you, with a, and it and it can be as simple as what the camera moved, how the camera framed the ship as it passed by or whatever. So we're we're always having those conversations and um, but uh, like I said, we're we you know John is is perfectly game to try new things, and um, so it's it's fun. You know, you uh, this is not our work, but if you think of Ludwig Göransson's music for the series. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was an, an example where John went, you know, took a risk and went completely a few, far afield of, of what had been established previously, and it and it works great. And so, when, in smaller ways, in visual effects, we we test those uh, ideas and boundaries uh, all the time. But as as Grady said, it's nice to have kind of a bedrock or or like I said, guardrails that of an established universe and a feel. And we particularly, I think, we look at the original trilogy more than anything else in terms of, you know, vibe vibe wise um mm. but john is um it's great he says he's a great partner he's what i call a curious director there's some directors who kind of don't want to know how the sausage is made as they say when it, visual effects because they feel like they'll they'll think too much about whether something's hard or easy or whatever and mm. they just want to be purely creative i think and that there i could see merit to that but john is not like that he's a creative uh, curious director who is interested in processes be, uh, and partly because he always wants to be improving them so they can get the most on screen that he can possibly get like if he he wants to know if something is massively inefficient it may look cool massively inefficient then he knows that's drawing resources away from five other things he may want to include in in the series and he's great that way he's a great partner that way and and um we're constantly horse trading with him about you know, well, this this is going to be really difficult to execute this way. But if we did it this way, it probably looked just as good. And then we'll have the ability to do all these other things. And, and mm. uh, he's he's great that way. The efficiency is is something that I often think about when I think about the Mandalorian because of the you know the big revelation, of course, in series one was was stagecraft. These giant LED screens that you could work with to kind of extend sets and and shoot in camera. And you know, I think a lot of people assume that it it saves a huge amount of time but at the same time you've kind of had to flip the production workflows on their head and you have to have the effects ready before the live action is shot um how does that kind of um influence your work and how how has that changed from season one through to season three is there is there more use of stagecraft or less use or or better use <laughs> um i would say that uh, we were a bit more selective this season, I think it's one of those things where every season you you know you've learned something, and uh, and this is you know full disclosure. This is my first uh, first season on the show. It was Richard Bluff, and did a fantastic job working with Hal in the first two. But there's a lot to glean from that experience, and and John has picked up on those things too. So um, it meant that during pre production and working with the VAT, when we're seeing early versions of environments who were kind of flying through environments and, you know, and, and VR and stuff, we, we, often we'd say, you know what, this is a, this would be a great use of stagecraft technology. And, and, uh, and I think, so we try to be a bit more targeted. Um, that didn't mean we did less of them. We did about 60, uh, loads. Some of them are duplicates, but it's quite a number of different environments. Some of my favorites are the ones that I think had were the most clever use of the technology took place in episode three. That was uh, Isaac Chung's episode, which is, you know, super Hitchcockian, very deliberate, you know, like it was, everything was very kind of planned out and, and uh, working with, it was Dean Cundy who shot it, you know, who's brilliant. So we, um, there, you know, like there's a, it's very simple, right? There was a, the shot of Pershing when he's in his office space, right? He's in his cubicle and uh, he's just one of many and, you know, working in this kind of amnesty um, uh, thing. And he 
the we built, I think we had about six cubicles that were practical, that were in the foreground, and that's on the volume floor, and it's just a nice set. And then beyond that, now we're replicating those same uh, cubies kind of into the volume wall, and it's all virtual behind it. And we had, um, we had actual characters kind of walking around. We had droids kind of sliding around, all live on the wall. It was all kind of triggerable action. But that, it's such a great, like, uh, the repetition of forms, seeing kind of geometric uh, forms in the foreground that kind of go off into the distance. But when you're, you're in there and you're in kind of a box and you've and, and things are more geometric, um, you don't know it. You don't know where you are. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty immersive. So anyway, there were many cases like that. Of course, we did, um, as a rule, though, we still do all, all cockpit work in the volume, you know, especially with you know, Mando has shiny Beskar and he's flying his shiny N1 with the big canopy and stuff. It's pretty imperative that you shoot that uh, with real-time imagery for lighting and reflection. You just, there's really no, like blue screen just does not work for something like that. The, um, uh, the what was the, the Hyperloop in episode six in Bryce's episode on the planet of Plazir, we had a whole environment loaded up um, where we could travel through the Hyperloop tube over that landscape and pretty much ev everything, right? That we, we built the actual pot, but it's all glass. And then, of course, there's Mando with this shiny um, armor, and it's just reflecting everything in that environment as they travel. And most of those shots were um, non-effect shots, right? Uh, no VFX needed, which is, which is great, which means, Jamie, that the, all of the work that you've now preloaded, right? All the effort that you went into developing that environment, having the content team make it look as real, you know, very realistic, and making it real time for um, for the walls pays off. Now you're getting shots just like you're on a location, and it's going right in your movie. That said, we got outside a lot this year. We didn't always just kind of jump in the volume. When we could go somewhere, if we could go to a location, um, you know, we we shot aerial footage in. Uh, in, in the all over the Isle of Skye, you know, for the Kalevala dogfight. We um, shot lots of plates and, and, and did a lot of kind of um, data capture in, uh, in Lake Powell for the, that kind of opening sequence. Anyway, so it's, it's a mixture um, for the volume work this year. You mentioned um, previs there, and I just wanted to direct the question to you, Hal, because previs um, has kind of changed the the way the workflow of, of your business, you know, and how how flexible are those tools um, in terms of giving the director the flexibility to, to change something late on? I mean, do you go back to previs, or does previs kind of get locked in, and then you work on the kind of high res assets from that point, or can you always return to previs if if you need to? you know, make amendments or redo a shot in a way that wasn't initially conceived that way? Yeah, well, we're constantly sort of revising that process. Um, we've been working with Third Floor all along on um, the Mano series. They're great. Um, one of the things that's, I don't know, unique, but unique to at least to my experience on this show is that, um, you know, most of the shows I've been on uh, previous is focused on big, visual effects, big technically complex sequences to sort of help solve those technical problems. Um, whereas on Mandalorian, uh, so far the, the, um, task of previous has been to previous the entire episode. Cause it's not just about uh, number one to, to figure out, um, what needs to happen on, uh, the volume, right? That's the, one of the issues with it. Um, because you need to pre-plan, obviously, because you're front-loading all that uh, creation of, of the environments and stuff. And then, and yes, big visual effects sequences, but also just straight drama scenes. Um, the reason being, John likes to kind of prototype the whole episode and get it all up and running in this rough form to evaluate just how it's working as as a story, just purely as, as a filmmaking tool, um, not necessarily about um, solving technical problems. But what that means is that uh, you know, the, the previous team 
you know, they have to do everything in the episode, as I said, even just straight dialogues. So sometimes that means that a big complex visual effects sequence that's maybe mostly CG, like a dogfight in space or something like that, um, the previous might have to kind of just be um, not a placeholder, but uh, but definitely not a blueprint for what comes later because they kind of need to get on with the rest of the episode. And so then it'll come to my team either um, ahead of shooting um, if 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 um, there are a lot of questions that need to be answered, like a sequence like the um, the turtle crocodile thing that attacks uh, right, in, right at the beginning of the season. Um, that was a sequence where we needed to hammer away at that before shooting started so that they would know what stunt pieces to shoot, you know, all the live action stuff kind of surrounding the creature and that are going to need to interact with it. We needed to know what the action was. We needed to come up with things like the death roll, the, the gator roll that it does and things like that. Um, so we would, that was a situation where previous got it to a certain point and then we in animation kind of took it on and continued to kind of beat on it until uh, shooting started and then went into a normal post-production sort of mode. Then there are other sequences like, for instance, uh, uh, something maybe happening like a dogfight in space or something where we kind of know what the interior cockpit pieces need to be so we don't have to get the sequence perfect before shooting happens. And then we can continue to tweak and uh, invent and polish some of the gags and things uh, that happen in post-production. So it's kind of a whole mix. Um, personally, I prefer whenever possible to get the previous team to do revisions, whether it's ahead of shooting or, or even a little after, when we can. Again, sometimes they've had to move off onto the next episode or the next sequence or whatever, and we kind of can't steer them back and we take that on and at them. So it's a whole mix, but um, but it's a good relationship. And actually what we're trying to do going forward is for Grady and I to have more sort of uh, tight integration with Previs at the outset um, to kind of steer that stuff so that it can be, it can get much closer to what it's going to be before shooting happens. And, and there's less tinkering that has to happen later. Cause ideally, you know, the, the previous does serve as a blueprint for everybody for at least large issues. And so the closer you can get it to that, the better. So it's, you know, it's been evolving over the seasons in terms of when and where we get involved directly with them versus them working directly with the, the, the episode director or with John and then visual effects engaging later. We're engaging now from the very beginning. And, and uh, so it's been kind of nice evolution over the, the course of the, of the uh, seasons. The, the evolution behind the scenes, <laughs> um, yeah. as you two as characters almost, yeah. Um, the Mandalorian, you know, has these big, these big moments, but, you know, with effects work, you're always wanting to serve the story, you always wanted to serve the character. Yet you have these massive moments, you know, with the, like the dinosaur turtle thing that you mentioned, the Shriek Hawks, you know, you've got the Minds of Mandalore scene, you've got that big final battle. How do you go about trying to find that balance between having these big wow moments, but not for them to be kind of distracting to the story itself? Well, I think um, sometimes uh, spectacle um, can... It, it, if that's all it is and, the, and everything is, is, is kind of devoted to that scope and the visuals of kind of large scale epic shots and stuff, you definitely can lose sight of character threads and kind of the, the more personal stuff. A lot of this kind of comes from John because he, he, you know, he talks about when you kind of go large, but you always have to bring it back to something kind of personal. And of course, that's, that's always been Grogu, right? Like it, all, it, all it takes is one close up of Grogu and a little, you know, a look or a sound, and you're back to the personal, you're back to the relationship between Grogu and, and, and Mando or Grogu and Bo. Um, so I think some of it comes from shot design, you know, like I remember, uh, this is episode four, it's it's uh, Carl Weathers episode where, you know, you have this young boy, this Mandalorian who's going to, you know, he's, he's getting his helmet for the first time, and he gets snatched by the giant eagle. And of course, this is a big set piece. We've got jetpackers kind of flying around chasing it. And you could, um, it's very energetic, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a, there's a lot of uh, great energy kind of in that scene. I remember actually how kind of in some of the early reviews, like with, uh, with John, you know, Paul Kavanaugh showing kind of early blocking and immediately John was like, 
where's the camera? Like, how would you shoot? How are you shooting this? How would you shoot this if you were shooting it for real? You know, like what, what, uh, what, what technology would you use? So the key was to kind of uh, create kind of a, like a cinematic language, you know, a visual style that felt real, that felt kind of cinematic. So we, everything turned into air to air. It's like, you know, helicopters following jet packers on long lenses. We started doing um, uh, the head mounted cameras, like little GoPros, like on Paz Vizsla. So, which is great. So you get, you get scope, you get wide, all of a sudden you cut in tight and now you're actually flying with Paz Vizsla. We do long lenses of the boy in the, in the hand. So I, I really think it's about shot design and within, you know, inside of a, a big set piece that kind of keeps you, uh, keeps the actual narrative and the character story alive, even when the, the spectacle is, is, is so big. Mm. Yeah, it, mm. it, it grounds you, doesn't it? It, <laughs> it? it gives you something to sort of tether yourself to subconsciously, probably for us as an audience, but great that that intention is there from, from you guys behind the scenes. Um, how some of the characters, of course, in, in Mandalorian are expressionless, you know, there, there's... Therefore, in your animation, you have to create expression, you have to create emotion. How much of a challenge was that to find um, within your work on this show? Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. We we went through a whole um, sort of exercise in that regard on Rogue One, uh, some back where we were doing K2SO. And there was a desire at the outset of that project to explore a droid that might have facial expressions. And which... If you think about it, it isn't very Star Warsy because even the most anthropomorphic droids like C-3PO, their face don't move. Um, and if you're going to go down that path, you have to have a droid with very sophisticated facial movement to express anything. You know, you can't just be eyebrows and, you know, a mouth like a smile and frown. Anyway, so we went through that whole thing and, and, and it taught me a lot about how strong and important pantomime is and the kind of... Um, what it is about a performance that creates, connects with the audience and creates emotion. And, you know, obviously Alan Tudyk as K2SO is super funny and his comic timing was brilliant. And we didn't, as funny as his face can be, he's got great expressions. We kind of didn't need it, especially if the audience never saw the footage of him and just saw K2SO. So anyway, so flash forward to Mandalorian. Yeah, I mean, we have, and this isn't even my department, but we have lots of main characters who, who are faceless, pretty much all of them including the, the main character. Um, and, but, you know, we're frequently tasked with bringing sort of emotion and, and, and audience connection to things that, um, that don't, uh, you know, have, uh, ordinary faces or don't have faces at all. I mean, you look at RTD2 or, you know, in, in our, in season three, we had R5, who's mostly practical, of course, it must be said, but, you know, there are times when we have to do him uh, animated and do little gags with him and things. And, you know, I, I feel like the, those kinds of droids going all the way back to R2-D2 are an awesome example of communicating emotion and, and, um, you know, generating empathy with something that's completely un unanthropomorphic, doesn't have a face, doesn't might, you know, arguably has an eye, but it doesn't blink. And, um, and, you know, you can get tons of expression and emotion out of, out of characters like that. Even the little mouse droids that you can, communicate fear, frustration, all kinds of things just with how they move and little sounds that they make, which also uh, plays a, obviously a huge, huge role. Yeah. I just wonder if your work, because of the expressionless characters of the Mandalorians, if your work in character animation has to be more amplified to kind of, you know, set the balance or not? I don't think so. It's funny. I, like I said, I think most of it comes from body language. Like you don't have to amp that up. Um, you you can. Um, my Alexa is going off. Um, you you don't have to um, uh, amp that up. I don't think to a to a sort of the way you would with a with an uh, animated like a cartoon ish character where you kind of push those things and and actually downplay other things like the naturalism in those cases you downplay and the poses and things you really push and make kind of antic. I don't find we really have to do that. We're still living in a live action world. Um, there's there's all kinds of levers you can pull to get, uh, as I say, get generate empathy and and understanding and um, a, an emotional connection with the audience without having to to sort of overdo it. Mm. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, looking, you know, we talked about the sort of the the changes that are made from season one to season three in terms of using the technology, using the tools um, at your disposal. Is some of that also about having, you know, the time to kind of debrief at the end of a, a show's uh, run and then making sure you've assembled the right team for the job as well? Uh, certainly. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we learn so- every show we do, we learn something new from you know what, and 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 uh, you start having ideas about even while you're working on a show, you're like, oh, you know what, that's something really cool. We should file that away, and the next time we do this, <laughs> let's let's try that out. You know, there's so there's always kind of new ideas, um, and yeah, you we and we're you know it's all about the people, right? Working with with the right people, get finding the right collaborations. Um, every probably every season, and I wasn't on the first two. There's been, you know, some slightly new people that have kind of plugged into that, and that's great, right? New, fresh perspectives. We get that naturally with uh, with the episodic directors, you know, like you just have all of a sudden come someone comes in with, um, you know, they're all they all want to work in the Star Wars universe, but they have their own history and experience and 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 uh, you know vision, and it's great, and we learn from that, you know. So I think it's, I do think that there's growth um, from season to season, but it isn't like we sit around and 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 you know say okay. This didn't work. We don't do this. Let's 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 reorganize and do it a cert, a, a different way. But hey, if there is a better way, and I I think like Hal was saying earlier, John is kind of interested in that and in process, you know, and he does. It's like, hey, you know what? If that didn't work last year, and or that was inefficient, as Hal was saying, let's change it. You know, well, how could we do that better? Yeah, I really I really enjoy um, uh, getting to work with a whole slate of directors rather than just one on a project because. The, the relationship with directors is always enjoyable for me on projects. I always find that a really interesting part of the job. And you get, you know, a whole crew of them on a on a season, which is pretty pretty neat. Peter Ramsey was awesome to work with this year and or this season. And uh, Rick is always great. You know, he's gone from being sort of one of the directors to kind of running along with John this, you know, season three and writing a lot on it. And um, and he's great. And it's always. Uh, I, I really enjoy watching too when directors come in who maybe their background hasn't really had anything to do with visual effects or Star Warsy kind of stuff, and they have a really different sort of mode of working and thinking about things. But then John's always there to kind of mentor them in terms of best practices for interfacing with us and getting the best result in visual effects, and that's kind of kind of cool to watch. Um, the other thing I, I, I was going to say is, and this goes back a few questions back, I think what you were talking about, um, you know, maintaining, uh, you know, when you've got big, big visual effects and you're trying to keep true to the story and, and the characters and all that. One of the things I'd like, um, at the risk of sounding like a, a, a suck up, is, uh, one of the things I like about working with John and his dailies is he's he's got what I call feelings first dailies, which is that we'll play a sequence down for him to show him the latest animation or in, in Grady's case, the latest comps and things and, you know, what's happening. And John will never start by saying, oh, you know, that third shot in, the contrast looked a little bit off or that, you know, there was weird about the thick or the creature didn't, doesn't feel like it has weight. Never starts there. He'll, he'll have notes. He'll say, I've got some notes. Number one, he almost always defers to the episode director to see what they might have to say uh, when when they're involved with that stuff, uh, or Rick or Dave Dave's on the call, uh, Filoni, um, which is almost always. Um, but then when John jumps in, he he always starts with how the sequence made him feel, and of course by extension, then how he expects it to make the audience feel, and whether it's achieving the stuff narratively, emotionally, uh, you know, et cetera, that he intends it to to have, and and he'll we'll talk through all that stuff first, which. For one thing, I find it enormously educational for me because we don't start talking about visual effects. We start talking about story and the and whether there's clarity, whether it's hitting the emotional beats, all that stuff gets talked about first. Then we drill down into, you know, that this shot doesn't quite look real yet, or that creature's movement isn't right, or whatever. We get we get to that stuff last in the conversation. We get to it. We get to it last. And I I really like that because for one thing, I think it's emphasizing what is most important, right? How is this making us feel? Let's not get into the weeds first. Let's take 10 back and talk about it. Um, 
and I just I just really enjoy that. Also, it engage he he um, encourages you know sort of all departments to speak up. You know, it's it's perfectly okay for the editor or, or whoever to say to make a comment about a visual effects shot, and it's perfectly okay for us to propose a solution of, hey, what if we combine these two shots, or what if we took this shot out and put this over here, and it doesn't step on toes, and it's done in a respectful way and all that, but John just really encourages that kind of uh, group communication in a in a structured way. Um, it's not a free, but and I just enjoy that so much. It's great, and I think it produces really good work. Um, I really do, so. Yeah, leave, yep. leaving room for creativity seems to be something that you know, ILM has had from from the start in a way, you know, George employed people almost based on personality types. And um, I, it feels like there's still a bit of the essence of that um, still remaining. Um, Grady, you oversaw all of the, the vendors that you work with, because this is not just an ILM production, you work with other effects houses. How do you go about sort of pulling all of those threads together, making sure that it's a cohesive visual aesthetic? Yeah, a lot of it is, uh, well, I'll say just right from the start, a number of these facilities uh, have been working on Mando from the beginning. So they, um, they've they learned, right? And they they kind of know the brief, a lot of them. So hybrid image engine, um, important looking pirates. These are really ghost, brilliant facilities that really, really d generated some great work this season. So that helps. Um, I like as a, you know, as a supervisor, to because Hal's talking about how we're so kind of privy to kind of the the big story, right? It's not just about the shot. You know, we know we know when it gets down to the shot level, we know what we have to do to execute that. But I think um, even down to the to the artists, it helps to have kind of the big picture. This is what this is what this story is about. This is the feeling we're trying. You know, th th these are you know these are the emotional notes we're wishing to hit. Um, and we show a lot of artwork. I love because it's you know. Doug Chang and his team, they they generate these beautiful kind of, uh, you know, uh, concept art, you know, dreams, you know, uh, image scapes. So sharing a lot of that. So they kind of get the vibe. They're all kind of on board. They know the brief. Um, that helps, right? Now everyone's kind of working to the, that same goal. Uh, and, then all, and then really it's, it's being, you know, having lots of good open reviews, um, sharing work sometimes. It's like, hey, you know what? That looks great. IOP was just doing something similar and I thought that looked really cool. I'm going to send it to you. You know what I mean? Like in some cases I've even had reviews where I brought two vendors together and because they're both maybe tackling something similar um, and they can kind of, you know, collaborate or coordinate and, and problem solve together. Um, team effort kind of stuff, Jamie. I think that that's kind of what, that's what does it. Mm, yeah. Sounds, sounds like a, a, an excellent approach. One of the questions I always avoid in my podcast when I'm talking to people about their their careers, like when Hal and I spoke about his career, you know, from start to where it currently is. One of the questions I don't ask people is, what is your favorite sequence? What is your favorite shot? But we're here specifically today to talk about a specific show and the fact that you've been nominated for this Emmy, which is fantastic. So is there a particular shot or sequence that you look at in season three and you think, wow, that that's my favorite season? It might be a shot you didn't work on. It might be a shot that a different vendor worked on. Um, or it might be an animation that Hal worked on. Is there something for you, Grady, that stands out? There is. I mean, for me, you know, there's, well, there were lots of shots. We went to eight planets, tons of unique environments and stuff. But it's, for me, it was all about Mandalore this season. And, uh, you know, that it's something, of course, the the audience was really anticipating it, you know, um, just because they it's been talked about. You, you knew we had to go back to Mandalore to go to Living Waters to be redeemed. So that's a big thing. You know, anybody, you know, all of the fans of the uh, the animated show, of course, they know the history of Mandalore. And, and of course, they saw the great, the purge, you know, the um, in, in, in the last season. So uh, it was something we had to get. We just had to get it right pretty much at every level. And Again, Doug Chang, they generated so much art for Mandalorian. It was just beautiful stuff, you know, like really just imagery that's very soulful. And um, and that descent, that initial journey where you follow Den, and it's really interesting when you think about it because it starts, you know, well, up in space, he's floating above and he's talking to, you know, his son. And then you have the this blanket of, of, of this massive storm, right? And then underneath that, that kind of reveals 
the landscape for the first time and the devastation and the, uh, we call it the Trinitite, you know, um, like encrusted uh, surface, which used to be sand. Um, all going all the way down into the mines, you know, going down into the sewers, finding the living waters. So if you were to map that out, and we did, like we have this kind of chart, we were just following this descent. And to John, it's not just a physical descent. He wanted it to be kind of psychological too, like very imagistic, especially when we go underground, wanted it to be very nightmarish. So there was just a lot of very intentional design uh, and development that went into us experiencing Mandalore and revealing that for the first time. You know, the the, the ruins of, of uh, Sundari, you know, that was a big shot. Um, that's one of my, I'll just say it, that's one of my favorite shots. Important looking pirates just killed it, you know, when you're seeing that domed city from above over, over Bo's ship. Um, so yeah, for me, there was uh, that, in, you know, it's where all of the cylinders are firing at the same time. Um, I felt like the, you know, all the filmmakers really knew exactly what they wanted to do. They got the tone just right, you know, walking through the, um, through the, through the mines and through, um, you know, uh, through the sewers. Uh, yeah, that was probably the most rewarding out of, out of this season for me is kind of going back and, um, it was probably the most daunting in the beginning, but the most rewarding <laughs> ultimately. Great. And what about you, Hal? I was kind of going in the same place. Um, <laughs> you know, John brought Phil Tippett in to hmm. help design um particularly stuff around the that that sort of mech lair where the, the the droid is with the mech spider thing and that whole sequence and what we see in that went through a bunch of changes there was some, there was some quite big changes uh, uh so it's tough and um paul that was a sequence paul uh headed up and and uh contributed some great ideas to by the way like when the um the head sort of pops off and crawls away back to the spider mech that that was a contribution of Paul's and other things. But um, uh, I just, I like the design of the mech. I like the interior that Phil designed. I like the creepiness of it. And, and it, because it felt Star Wars, but almost a little, like it was almost, we were expanding Star Wars a little bit in terms of what Star Wars can be. It's like Star Wars isn't often horror, you know? It's the other things. It can be comedy. It can be, you know, dramatic space opera and things. But it isn't often horror, and I felt like we were kind of dipping a toe into that world with some, just visually and, and everything, and how creepy that spider is, and it grabs Mando and puts him in that thing, and so I really dug all that stuff because I felt like we were kind of expanding what Star Wars could be, and at least in a live action world, um, a, a bit, and uh, and I just liked Phil's whole contribution to it and his the whole creepy environments that he designed. They they built he built miniatures of them. Like six scale, I think, so pretty big, but dressed with all the weird little artifacts and objects and creepy things, and um, and it really gave a nice creepy touch to all that stuff. And John loved all of that, right? Didn't he? He just all of the 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 weird uh, totems that they had designed, and and the creepy like it looks like a root, but it almost looks like entrails on the floor. You know, you don't know what's what's kind of mechanical or what's organic. It's just it's really cool, creepy stuff. And we actually scanned a lot of those pieces from the miniatures and incorporated that into our 3D scenes so we could kind of keep, we, you know, we literally just took his models and kind of added them, uh, add them to the shots. Mm. Well, for what it's worth, those two scenes that you just mentioned are my two favorite scenes of the series as well. I've got them written here down next to me. So yeah, no, thank you so much for your time today. And thanks for the work you do. You know, people are sitting on this side of the screen are really enjoying what you've been doing these last few years with the TV shows. And um, let's hope uh, there's plenty more where that came from, um, because yeah, we're, we're ready to lap it up. <laughs> Coming soon to a TV near you. <laughs>